we are live. Welcome to WandaVision Review. Naps. Yeah, so, the only thing I will... In this video, I will be spoiling the MCU leading up to the show, but not including this show. I'm not going to be spoiling anything in this show, except for the times where I verbally warn before I spoil and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger if you don't want any spoilers. If, if you want to hear what I think about any of the episodes with spoilers, I've already recorded videos on all nine episodes and yes, the, the link to that will be in the description box. Now, let's see. Yeah, so according to Wikipedia, Kevin Feige said viewers would not need to be familiar with the MCU to understand the series, but there would be a wealth of rewards for those who have seen all the films and knew the plans for Phase 4. I largely agree with him, but one thing is, don't pay too close attention. Yeah, I realize. Yeah. I'm going to start spoiling the MCU very, very soon, but in case you're still watching, if you don't know the MCU, if you haven't watched Endgame, Avengers Endgame, and you want to watch this show, don't pay attention to the characters in the opening Marvel logo. You know, it, it won't be terribly difficult. There's music playing during it, just look away until you hear the music change. I don't know, maybe they should have done two different versions of the logo, and when you start streaming on Disney+, Plus, you chose whether it's going to have endgame spoilers or not, but it has endgame spoilers. It spoils some really major things, so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, honestly, technically, you could make this the first MCU thing you ever watch, though if you do, you will have to wait through a number of movies before seeing the leads of this in movies, I guess I could just really quickly... Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and... Uh... Okay, so, brief spoiler for... No, wait, never mind, sorry. I forgot, I am already spoiling MCU. So yeah, from here on out, spoilers for the MCU, but if I spoil anything for this show, I will warn first. But yeah, if you... If you watch this show before you watch the MCU, you will not see Wanda and Vision before Age of Ultron. And yeah, I, I don't, I didn't sit down and count, but there's a bunch of movies leading up to that. I mean, technically, part of Vision is Jarvis, and he appears right from the very start of the MCU, but yeah. Now, some people were frustrated with not getting very many answers right away. I personally love the way they did this show, but I do understand their frustration. And if you haven't watched any episodes of the show yet, and you do want to know going in how long before you start getting answers. Okay, so, yeah. Spoiling. You, you are going to start, spoiling the show, you are going to start getting answers in episode four and I think yeah okay and some more and some spoilers on how the episodes are set up episodes one through three are only the sitcom episode four is all answers outside the sitcom and after that episodes will go back and forth between the sitcom and the people out right outside the force field trying to find answers. So, no more spoilers for now. Let's see. I, yeah, okay, real quick. Spoilers. Episode 8 has a lot of important answers. Okay, so no more spoilers for now. This is the most outside of the mainstream thing the MCU has produced since maybe Guardians of the Galaxy 1, and I'm here for it. I hope they keep taking chances like this. 
you know, at, at first they played it fairly safe the first several years, but you know, with, with Guardians of the Galaxy, they were like, let's just, we, you know, I, I think they felt kind of invincible. They were like, we can do this. We can make anything work. We can make you cry when an intelligent cyborg raccoon cries because his best friend, an anthropomorphized tree, which only speaks three words, dies. And they did. They, they made it work. And, yeah, so I'm just briefly gonna... Yeah, this is technically spoilers, so... This show comments on the following changing over the decades of seen in sitcoms and TV ads, the depiction of the nuclear family, and what it believes about how happy that family is, gender roles. The show also comments on TV, especially sitcoms, as escapism. It comments on grief. It's very emotionally complex. No more spoilers for the time being. So, plot. I am not sure if I should give away whether or not this is set after Endgame. Let's go with, it's set sometime after Age of Ultron. Wanda Maximoff is with Vision, Thor's Vision, Ultron's Vision, Viz? Viz, Viz Vision. And they're trying to settle down in Westview. Or... You know, maybe it's the Eastern European Wanda's view of the West, perhaps, for a nice suburban married life together. Although they are technically in Jersey, so it's going to be hard. It looks like it looks just like the sitcoms from the 1950s and onwards made it look. The ones Wanda watched in her youth in Soviet Sokovia, and they clearly love each other and are very happy together. They wanted time, and now they have it. Time was all they wanted. Life could be perfect when it's made just for you. It's just so good to see Vision back. Well, back. I mean, it's not... He didn't go anywhere. He was never gone. Nothing bad happened to him. And now he has an office job. She's a happy homemaker. And they're gonna raise twins together. It's all for the children. No Twilight in the Zone. No, it's a good life. But... Is there actually something else going on? Because every so often, the facade will crack. Now, I suppose I will briefly... Yeah, so, individual episode plots. Several episodes literally have these very, very frequently seen classic sitcom plots. And I guess... Let's see, should I give away? Technically, I'm not sure I can really give too many details. Yeah, okay, I'll just I'll just very briefly, I, I won't say exactly when these happen, but you have important dinner with the boss, so you gotta make sure to impress him. You have a magic show where things maybe don't work out entirely how they hoped they would. You have a Halloween episode, you have a very special episode, and yeah, so some spoilers for the episodes. Each episode has a mood or a specific emotional environment. Over the course of the series, the couple go through the different stages of being a couple, including considering splitting up. So. The first episode is this very important dinner with the boss who they have to impress and a bunch of things go wrong, including that Wanda thought it would be an intimate dinner, just the two of them. So the first episode is marital bliss. They're in love with each other. They're each other's everything. And you know, Wanda tries to seduce Vision. And the second episode, Wanda has to impress the most important wife in, this, in the suburbs. And Wanda and Vision both put on a magic show. Things go wrong. He's acting drunk during it. So they're trying to establish themselves as part of the suburbs. Episode 3, Wanda's pregnancy keeps moving fast and she has the twins. They are unsure how the pregnancy will play out. But they're eager, happy, proud. And the very ending has Wanda throwing out Geraldine, which clearly creeps out Vision. So starting to, you know, some, some crack. Ah, 
the some some problems between the couples. The, the couple are starting to have so, to have problems in their relationship. And let's see. So yeah, and episode four doesn't really have. There's almost no new sitcom stuff, so I don't have a lot for this particular aspect. Now, episode 5 is on a very special, you know, yeah, it's a very special episode. The episode title is on a very special episode. And the kids grow from infants to 5 to 10. They find a dog, the dog dies. And, you know, gradually, there are, yeah, there are a lot of emotional issues. You know, they have to cope with the fact that babies don't behave the way the parents want to. And, let's see, yeah, and what appears to be the Fox X-Men Pietro shows up and ends this impassioned argument between Wanda and Vision, so there's trouble in paradise. Episode 6 is the Halloween episode. It's playful for the twins and Pietro. Sinister, creepy Twilight Zone for Vision, who's going against what Wanda wants for them. Episode 7 is Wanda slowly deteriorating, and Agnes babysits the twins. The couple have separated, and while Vision still wants to find out what's going on, wants to... It, uh, yeah, w Wanda wants the comfort of how things used to be between them, and I've seen some people say that Wanda is basically being an abusive parent based on the way the kids are, when they're around her, the way they talk about her, and some parents do get become abusive despite previously being the parents, including when they get separated from their partner, and... And yeah, episode 8, we get a lot of backstory, let's see, we, we, we find out a lot about Wanda's past trauma, and let's see, yeah, that is, yeah, so, no more spoilers for the time being. Some episodes will end on a cliffhanger, and basically every episode has at least one major dramatic thing, perhaps a reveal happen near the end. It is a show that badly wants you to obsess over it for the entire week between episodes, making it almost impossible to wait an entire week before the next episode, and it's incredibly good at it. I would personally say that every single episode does have some plot progression and character development, but it is fair to say that some episodes have very little progression of the main plot only focuses on the sitcom plot, which by itself doesn't have very many major implications. And let's see. Yeah, some episodes you can watch the entire episode of maybe 30 minutes, and the amount of actual plot that affects things other than the sitcom only takes up a few minutes. There are no filler episodes. Every single one is is has, has something incredibly important. Now, you might wish that there was more in an episode than there was, but there's always enough that it was worth it, considering how dense the show is. I'm really glad they didn't try to fit in, fit it into less episodes than they did. And this is an incredibly bingeable show, although I will say, before you, if, if you're just coming into this, you haven't watched any of it yet, and you've decided you're going to binge, Start by just watching a few episodes and then see if you really think you're going to want to keep binging because there is a lot to take in, in almost all episodes. Now, let's see, and yeah, I have I record this right after having watched the ninth and final episode once, and I binged episodes one through eight just a few days ago, you know, rewatched them, and I had the filmmakers' intended reaction, both the second viewing and the, both the first and the second viewing, I got there eventually. The jokes made me laugh, the creepy stuff creeped me out, etc. And I actually, I, yeah, I, I was going to binge all eight episodes in a single sitting. I did have to stop between seven, after seven life stuff came up. I, you know, and I only watched episode eight a little later, but it was still, you know, I didn't, at no point did I really want to stop watching, even though, I mean, 
when I watched episode eight, it was less than a week since I watched it the first time, you know. But yeah, I try to try to rewatch episodes before I record a review so that I can have a lot of stuff fresh in my mind. I don't binge what. I just really briefly, I worry that someone's sitting out there think when I do a video it's reviewing something with like 10 seasons, I don't binge watch all of those episodes. I I, I only rewatch each, uh, get me into, let's see. I rewatch select episodes from the seasons. I only binge a season leading up to doing a video on the season thoughts. Yeah, I think that's going to have to do. Now, let's see. And I think. But yeah, it's it's an incredible, incredibly rewatchable show. Bingeable and rewatchable show. And let's see. Yeah. Excuse me. If you are watching my video right now and you haven't yet made up your mind on whether or not you're going to watch this mini series, I can understand why it might seem a little it's too far out of the mainstream for a lot of people. Please note this show does tie into the MCU. So if you choose not to watch it, you know, I don't know exactly what yet, but some of the stuff in this show, it seems like it's going to come up in Doctor Strange 2. And I've heard some say also Spider-Man 3. So, and and I could definitely see, because there's some really important setup in this show. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's possible that, you know, some people will make, like, videos that you can just watch that video. And you don't have to watch the entire miniseries if you just want the specific details, but yeah, I I do understand if some people, this show is 100% what I wanted, but I could totally understand why it might not be for, for everyone. Now, let's see, but, but yeah, you know, if you don't watch this, you might have trouble following some of the movies coming up. This miniseries and some of the other Okay, so I guess they're not technically MCU shows. They're Marvel Studios shows on Disney+. Plus. Give more screen time to characters that haven't gotten solo movies. And since you can stream them rather than... One second. Um, hmm. Right, yeah. Since you can stream them rather than you have them... On DVD, you know, in a ta in addition to watching them on your TV or on your computer, if you wish, you could watch them on your cell phone, which is very divisive. Because okay, device, it, well, move on. I am really, really happy that we have something this distinctly non-mainstream in the largely mainstream MCU. This is hugely unlike the rest of the MCU, and it was very gutsy to have this be the first MCU thing in so long. The first episode of this premiered January 15, 2021, after Spider-Man Far From Home premiered July 2nd, 2019. So, not quite two years, but I, it is like one and a half. And usually you do have to go to stuff like comic books in order to find something this unique. I like to say that when you open a comic book, you legitimately cannot be sure when, who, what, why, where, or how, and sometimes it's only by the end of the book or even in later issues that you get the answers to some of those questions. Obviously, the cover and title will have some clues, but sometimes the comic book actually isn't about the characters on the cover. It might be their parents or something, and you may not realize that until way later. And obviously, that is a lot harder to do with big movies. We want a proper ending to the movie. We paid cinema ticket prices for it. It was two hours, it cost $200 million to make, it should have a proper ending and some proper answers. Anyway, and something that's really cool about this show is 
it's actually not directly based on any comic. There isn't a comic where Wanda and Vision have a sitcom lifestyle in the suburbs, although there are stories where they do live in the suburbs, and there are, you know, shows where they... Uh, comics where the, like, they, they have... They, they wish that they could have a really ideal life in the suburbs, you know. And making it a show with multiple episodes allow them to do opening credits, end credits, and do entire episodes that legitimately feel like an actual sitcom, which makes it all the more effective when something that doesn't fit, something creepy, slips in. You know, they'll do the quick wrap-up at the end of the sitcom episodes in at least some of the episodes of this. I'm not going to give away how many or which. But because of certain aspects, it may feel extremely creepy to the viewer, and certainly we always really look forward to the next episode. I have been extremely happy with the MCU so far, and have high hopes that they'll be able to keep it going. And, yeah, I, I have almost nothing negative to say about this show, so, yeah, you know, if, if that's, if, if you want to hear something negative about this show, you may have to, you know, find, find someone else. I'm not sure. I have almost nothing negative to say about it. I, I was ecstatic when I first heard about the concept. I was really excited as we got more details and as we got closer to the premiere. I loved the first episode. I've loved every single episode throughout. I'm really going to miss the show. I'm, I'm really going to miss new episodes of this show. Anyway, and that is, yeah, by the end, it is a complete story. There is, there's stuff that will maybe, that, that maybe will be followed up on in the future. But if you sit down and you watch, if, yeah, if you, if you don't know anything else, if you just sit down and you watch this miniseries, you can just watch the nine episodes. You don't have to watch the MCU. You can follow what happens in the nine episodes. And by the end of the ninth episode, you will feel like a complete story has been told. A complete story has, in fact, been told. And I really admire that. The, there must have been a lot of... Ah, it must have been hard to, to not keep... Yeah, you know, the... the yeah, I'll move on. Let's see. And yeah, so like I said, I love the I've loved the MCU so far. There are also a number of movies in the Fox X Men continuity that I love. Other than Justice League, I've loved every DC movie that has come out since and including Wonder Woman one. I don't know about Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four. I have not been able to watch it yet. And I'm not saying that I don't understand why a lot of these comic book adaptations start from a place of realism and then build towards the comic book stuff. For sure, there are some terrible movies that try from the very start to be more like stylized and less realism-based comic books. Here's one of the things that I love about comic books, and that I feel like we are now getting closer to with comic book movies without it alienating a lot of the more casual fans. and without it leading to bad movies, since movies and comics are very different mediums. With comic books and video games, you can start with a really cool, far-off concept, including certain superpowers, costumes, hero and villain names, even an overall universe that is wildly different from reality. And then you start working on story, motivations, figuring out how to create fiction around the things that I've just mentioned. A lot of movies adapting comic books have felt like they needed to start from a place of realism and then gradually build towards the more comic booky stuff. And I already mentioned, I understand why and I do think it makes a lot of sense that, at least has made a lot of sense until recently to do it like that. But something that's frustrated me and other comic book fans is when you start there and you feel like you have to build the rest in a way where an average movie go can follow you, is that it will take many sequels to get to the really far out stuff, which, you know, that, that's why we were into comic books in the first place. So I'm really happy to see WandaVision and other Disney Plus shows doing these concepts. You know, before, in a lot of cases, we don't get those sequels or they end up doing a bad job handling the material. It's hard to make 
a lot of sequels without eventually running out of interesting places to take the characters, which is also one of the reasons I love that the MCU isn't featuring all of the same characters in all of the movies. I love sitcoms, I always have, and it's very clear that so do the people who made this show, so please do keep in mind that when I say things that might sound critical of sitcoms, it comes from a place of love. I love that they made the conscious choice to make this so much about being like a sitcom, especially because the comic isn't, and, it, it, you know, when you do, a, a comic book can't imitate sitcoms the way that a Disney Plus show can, because once again, it's once, you know, for, for the last nine weeks, once a week, you get roughly 30 minutes of sitcom, and yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give away whether every single episode has, has the sitcom thing, but, you know, when you tune in, that is perhaps the, the first thing you expect for it to be, and it uses the it uses the freedom that that has incredibly well. This would not have worked anywhere near as well if it was a couple of movies. The, the fact that at the start of the half hour we have a theme song and all this stuff, and then at the end of the episode, you know, you have the, the quick wrap-up of a sitcom thing, you know, they use that incredibly well. But yeah, you know, the, the comic isn't like a sitcom, and they could have chosen to make this show not very much like a sitcom, but it's so much better because it's like a sitcom. I mean, one of the reasons is clearly with the people, the, the people involved in making this love sitcoms. Another is that the comics using the suburbs is in part aspirational, so they watched sitcoms and did actually think that's what happiness looks like. And even without the sitcom thing, you could have had an aspirational life in the suburbs. Stepford Wives' overly really happy thing. And with the Twilight Zone, it, you know, it's, it's a good, yeah, it's a good life element intact. But the sitcom aspect makes it completely undeniable there is something weird going on. We watch the sitcom, we can immediately tell there is something wrong. No matter how deep a plunge MCU movies have previously taken into a genre, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's always felt like it was set in a world very similar to our own. I mean, the first Captain America movie isn't actually pro-war propaganda, even though it at times really resembles it, keeping in mind, I love that movie, I will always defend it. If not for it kind of making fun of pro-war movies, I would probably hate it. I am completely on the side of loving anti-war movies. This show is definitely more far out than we've ever seen before. So here it is very clear they have intentionally gone so far that there must be something going on we haven't seen before in the MCU. Like I alluded to earlier, we know that this is not what it looks like when Wanda and Vision are together. The the and and even yeah, even if you watch this and you you know that this is not the way, you know, yeah, I, I doubt very many people start watching this and have no idea that this is not the way these characters usually look, you know, that they weren't in the 50s and the they haven't been, you know, it's it's this thing like when you start watching this, like technically it plays like a sitcom, but you know these characters exist used to exist outside of a sitcom, so this is wrong, and you, you can't help but wonder why, and you're hanging on their every word because you're trying to figure out what is it that has happened, how did we get here? I do really hope that this is the first exposure to the MCU for at least some people because it must be an especially wild experience. I have to wonder if some people who start watching the MCU by watching this will at first expect all of it to be such a deep genre pastiche and how long they expect they spend expecting the sitcom reality to actually be the real reality. Also the sitcom thing used to be a way of reassuring straight cis white men that all they really have to do is get a job, help raise the kids, put food on the table, they don't actually have to work to make their wife happy and they deserve a wife. 
that is happy nevertheless and that kids the, the and kids that are well behaved you know since the the male ego may well be the single most frail thing in the entire you know, known universe and unknown universes as well and i am including myself in that i speak in part from experience it's like wet tissue paper in an oven yeah, keeping in mind, I'm not claiming to myself to be better than that. In fact, my own feelings, along with countless observations I've made of other men, is what I base this on. And, yeah, I'm just briefly going to give an example. So, spoilers for Sex and the City. Also, keep in mind that, like many other things on Sex and the City, this is not PG-rated. This is R-rated. I guess... Yeah, I'll just very briefly say, Steve and Miranda are, I think those are the right names, sorry, are, are together, and Steve is going to need new testicles because he has testicular cancer, and they're, wow, okay, yeah, I think we're back, okay, I don't know what just happened, um, hopefully it won't happen again, yeah, testicular cancer, they're talking about what size it it should be and Steve wants Moran, Miranda to on her own say you know yeah he they're asked medium large one you know and he he doesn't immediately say oh they should be large he kind of waits for Miranda Miranda to say and she says medium and he's hurt that she didn't say large and she's it, it, her exasperated response is you're a large medium you know, I, I think that really tell he could have just said they're large, you know, but nope, he needed her to say it on, you know, anyway, yeah, no more spoilers for Sex and the City. As you start watching the show, I recommend videos talking about Easter eggs and such on the show, especially videos made by new rock star, Screen Rant, Nerdist, and Screen Crush. Obviously, today you have to be very careful about spoilers, which was easier if you watched the show as episodes came out. If, if you're watching this review right now and you haven't made up your mind about the future shows, I think it'll probably be the best experience to watch the Disney Plus MCU shows as new episodes air instead of waiting for later, even if you love binging. I can, I can, I 100, I typically prefer binging shows. Now... All four films that feature Wanda are excellent, and each has a clear and excellent beginning, middle, and end. This show is excellent, and has a clear, excellent beginning, middle, and end. And honestly, the ending of this is one of the best endings of the MCU. It's it's incredible. It's yeah, it's 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 one of the best endings to anything I've ever seen. There are some mid credits and post credit scenes. I suppose, yeah, spoiler for the show, if you want to know which episodes to wait through the credits, or fast forward through the credits, you can, since, again, it's streaming, the last three episodes, so 7, 8, and 9, have a post credit scene, or is it a mid credit Each of them has at least one scene after the credits start rolling, so, yeah. No more spoilers for the show. I would recommend watching the entire end credits through at least at least through the oh, the first set of stylized ones at least once. There are some really great details in there, but you know if you if you know the MCU, if you watch any end credit scene, there are always these very nicely stylized. Yeah, let's see and and something I also really appreciate is that. There's sometimes more than one set of um, end credits. There's the sitcom show end credits, and there's end credits for the actual show in the in the real world. Anyway, and like with regular sitcoms, individual episodes will have individual plots, and like some sitcoms, over the course of multiple episodes, characters and relationships will be developed. But there is also an overarching plot in this show. Some will find it moves too slowly. And yeah, you know, sometimes an entire episode will pass with little progression of the overall plot.
and yeah so the the writing let's see i forget exactly who said this but someone said that the show was somewhat like norman rockwell meets leave it to beaver and yeah jack schaefer was hired as head writer of the series in january 2019 after previously working as a writer on the Marvel Studios films Captain Marvel and Black Widow. And, let's see. Yeah, and Schaefer was set to write the first episode and ex executive produce the series. And Schaefer received comics material and an outline of what Marvel Studios hoped to accomplish with the series in order for her to help shape their ideas into a coherent structure. Oh, sorry. I should briefly say, basically, some of what I'm saying now is verbatim from Wikipedia, but if you go on Wikipedia, there might be spoilers, so I'm putting it in here. And Kevin Feige said the series would tell the story of Maximoff and Vision, show what Maximoff can do, explore who Vision is, and introduce the comic book name Scarlet Witch to the MCU in ways that are entirely fun, entirely funny, somewhat scary, and will have repercussions for the entire future of Phase 4 of the MCU. Also, there's probably some theories you have not been able to completely dodge. Even if you go into this knowing almost every spoiler, or if you've heard almost every theory, and you, you know, there, there are some things in the show that played out similar to what people expected I would still, I, I knew a lot of theories going in, and I still hugely enjoyed the show. I suppose if you've gotten to this point and you haven't heard any theories, if you think you'd prefer not to hear theories, you know, that, that might be good for you. Let's see, and Kevin Feige came up with the idea of having Max Malvin Vision be in a strange fantasy world of suburban bliss based on his love of sitcoms and how they can be used to escape from reality. Feige Schaefer, Shackman, and co-executive producer Mary Livinus dedicated this, um, themselves to nailing down the series' irreverent tone. Schaefer hired eight writers to the series' writing room, including four women and several people of color, because of her belief that stories are better the more perspectives you have. And Megan McDonald served as a staff writer on the series before being promoted to story editor. Many of the writers have previous television experience, which Schaefer used to help craft each episode within the larger narrative. One of the, uh, sorry, as one of the initial challenges for the series was figuring out how to tell the story in the long form structure of a limited series rather than a film. Schaefer compared the final approach to a multi-issue storyline in the comics, which felt WandaVision was in the bizarre space of being a tentpole movie within a limited series construct. She said the final series remained very close to her original pitch to Marvel Studios. And the series pays tribute to many eras and genres of American television throughout the years, including modern documentary-style sitcoms like Modern Family and The Office, Radish and Shockman focused on the family sitcom over other types such as workplace sitcoms because the family aspect kept the series very centered. Both Schaefer and Shackman studied past sitcoms to learn their trappings and styles while avoiding disappointing tropes from the older sitcoms that would not be acceptable in a modern series or society. Dan Feige spoke with Dick Van Dyke, the star of the eponymous 1960s sitcom, to learn how that series could be very broad with silly physical comic, comedy gags, and yet in no feels false. Van Dyke told them that his show was guided by what could and could not happen in real life. Other past sitcoms that inspired the series include I Love Lucy, My Three Sons, Father Knows Best, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, Bewitched, Family Ties, Friends, Third Year Rock, and Parks and Recreation. The series has meta -re references to Full House, which starred Olsen's older sisters, Mary Kate and Ashley. Schaefer compared her work on the series to the film Black Widow, saying WandaVision would be the polar opposite to the film's style of aggressive visceral action. While exploring past MCU films, she was drawn to the more mundane character moments, such as Maximoff and Vision enjoying their time in Scotland in Avengers Infinity War. Schaefer knew there was a sort of wonder and sincerity to the two characters, felt putting them in a sitcom setting would result in a calm and warm feeling through the, their familiar 
familiar family dynamic, despite the ridiculousness of the premise, she found the pair appealing because they are both outsiders who find each other. They're both different with capital D's. Livinus said the series has fun messing with the expectations of past suburban similar family sitcoms, would make the audience question where WandaVision fits into the MCU timeline. She added the Max Mob and Vision's romance helps ground the series and said some of the episodes deviate from the family sitcom structure. The series explores how Max Mob grew up in Eastern European country and relied on black market American products such as television. They work in and make fun of a lot of the tropes of sitcoms. That was it for the Wikipedia sec segment for now, at least. The following stuff I wrote myself. I'm very impressed by how densely packed the show is. You know, I I wasn't sure... When, when I noticed that early on, I wasn't sure they were going to be able to keep that up. But they do. From the very start to the very end, incredibly... Excuse me, incredibly dense. Even if you aren't really into the sitcom stuff, and again, I want to make 100% clear, I am very much, I, I love the sitcom stuff, always love sitcoms. Anyway, even if you aren't, there's pretty frequent indications that there's something strange going on. There's a huge amount of hints that there's something going on, references to stuff from comics, clues to mysteries. Never very long passes very long never passes on this show without something like that. And they somehow manage to make nearly all of it subtle enough that you can watch it and not be distracted. Like, if you don't really want to focus on these things, for example, there might be a hint in the way they phrase a joke, but you can also just laugh at the joke itself. A ton of the time... Let's see... Ah, uh, sorry. And, yeah, they have both... a. Yeah, there will be, I'm sorry, I need to figure out what this means, a ton of the time, right, a ton of the time they have both, and occasionally there will be stuff that can't really be interpreted as anything other than what it is. Allow me to try to give you a brief idea of a typical episode. One of the first things we'll see is a theme song and title sequence, which has clear references to maybe two or three different sitcoms, always appropriate for the decade that the episode is set. And from very early in the episode, we'll see Wanda and Vision's house in the interior will be a very clear reference to at least one sitcom. The storyline, the jokes, the clothes, the people are wearing, will all reference sitcoms. Sometimes completely different sitcoms, usually within an overall subgenre though, and somehow it doesn't clash. And every so often there will be a very clear reference to the comics, maybe to a piece of media that isn't a sitcom or comic. And it mocks the conformism and limiting gender roles, the polite, big, phony, smiling, and general celebration of the status quo, nuclear family living in the suburbs, of countless sitcoms. And and how much they smile and take everything so well is even more creepy when you think about what tragic figures Wanda and Vision have been in the MCU until now. And the show does an incredible job handling plot twists. Like, I think it, they, could have, they could be forgiven if they had put too many in, but... They manage to space it out right so that, yeah, you know, the, the, every single episode will surprise you with at least something in it. And let's see, I, I never felt like I was losing track of where the story was going or that the writers were. And I would say that I was satisfied with how much of, you know, you know, in a, in a miniseries, they're gonna, they're, excuse me, they're going to set up plot threads that don't go very far from right away. You know, they're, they're set up, and then maybe some, some, a little time will pass before more happens there, so that they can keep surprising you and such. And I was completely satisfied by the time I was done watching the finale. 
I guess I shouldn't say whether absolutely every single plot thread had been resolved or not, but I left it feeling satisfied. I didn't feel like there was a, a lot still, you know, yeah. I didn't feel like the show broke the promise that, a, you know, when you watch a piece of serial fiction, essentially there is an implicit promise that the stuff that is set up will be resolved. And, you know, some series do better, some series do worse. I, th this is one of the, my favorite, at least. I know not everybody loves it, but yeah. And honestly, I would, I, I really hope that the people who made this will make more, I mean, I don't know if, it might be a long time before we get something very similar to this, but yeah, you know, I if if the people who made this start making regular sitcoms, I think I might watch. The opening of this show grabs your attention immediately. From right away, it feels like a sitcom from the 1950s, and we know something isn't right. And again, like, hypothetically, they could have created two new characters and just had it be, you know, so, so that you're just sitting there watching and it's a sitcom and you wonder, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe that's just how it appears to us, but it's not, but no, from right away, you can tell these characters used to exist outside of a sitcom, so yeah. And the ending is incredible and satisfying. Again, some people felt that it wasn't it never loses your interest along the way. I, I know some people say that at least there's at least one episode that some people said was filler, but I just, I really don't see it. And I personally really don't like filler episodes. I, I, I understand that it's difficult to make sure that every single episode in a show really contributes a lot, but I do find it very frustrating when, I, I feel like if you have to make a filler episode, try to make something in it have some relevance, and yeah, there, there's no episode of this that only has a little bit of relevance to now. This takes some elements from the storyline in the comics where Wanda and Vision make a life in the suburbs, and when it comes to sitcoms also a tribute and pastiche homage. Perhaps to some extent a parody, but if so, a, you know, lovingly so. And I have to admit, I have not read the comics. The, that I've read a lot of the comics, but I did not read the specific ones that this is based on. But from hearing others talk about it, it seems like it was a satisfying adaptation. You know, obviously not, it, it couldn't, it's not a one-to-one, -one, you know, but... They, they got a lot of the best stuff in there. Olsen said that, Elizabeth Olsen said the sitcom setting is supported by the comic books. Feige told her that there were two specific comic series that he wanted to combine as inspirations for WandaVision, and the House of M comic book storyline was one of the, those inspirations. While commentators noted that the release of the series' official trailer in September 2020, the series referenced Vision and Scarlet Witch by Bill Mantio and Rick Leonardi, and The Vision and Scarlet Witch by Steve Enkelhart and Richard Howell, in which Scarlet Witch becomes pregnant by magical means. Shackman wanted to ensure the sitcom elements never felt like parody, but were as authentic as possible. They did an incredible job. I, I will admit, I have not watched very many sitcoms from the 50s and 60s. A few from the 70s, several from the 80s and 90s and 2000s, but I've seen enough clips to know that it, yeah, they did an incredible job. I, I know I've seen some people say that this was made by people who don't like the original, the, the sitcoms. I, I don't, I'm sorry, but they must have been watching a different show than I was because the, I, I'm not saying that there's no critique in this series of sitcoms, but it's not like just mocking them. It's not saying this is bad. It's more like, it's it's saying, isn't it kind of weird how every time a sitcom this and this, it's that and that? 
but it's not saying that sitcoms are just bad. And they they do and yeah, they do an incredible job of using superpowers and such of the of the various characters which, you know, like in in the in the four movies that Wanda is in three of them also vision i understand a number of people are unhappy with how much vision has gotten to do i i personally i i love all the all four movies and yeah anyway now yeah this is the direction here is really strong very focused and the director 100% understood how to make it work the best the budget for each episode was reported to be as much as $25 million, but $125 million total. So, you know, the, you, you maybe won't know where to expect something huge. And Shackman directed all of the episodes and grew up acting in sitcoms and has directed other comedy as well as action drama and VFX heavy stuff. So... It's, yeah, absolutely ideal person. Now, a lot of the time, the characters will behave relatively normally, but every so often there will be a little crack in the surface. surface. They will behave in a way detailed by sitcoms. You know, there, there's something that the doesn't fit the time period or setting perhaps even something that shouldn't be possible that breaks the laws of physics the actors were also shown episodes of past sitcoms before filming to help them capture the spirit of each tone and style since the approach to comedy is different in each decade a dialect code was used to work on how people would sound and move in each era with olsen adding the manners each decade were noted and you know, a number of the actors have to portray the characters in sitcoms across the decades, and they are utter chameleons. They do incredible at it. No matter the decade, their acting is on point, their hair is on fleek, their costume is on their body, and it's, yeah, and all the relationships are handled well. Married couples, friends, people who work for, together and for one another, children and parents, siblings. It's all very credible. Their relationships, their dynamics, their relationship dynamics. The the I, I think if you watch this show, once you watched all the way through it, go back and watch some of the earlier episodes to remind you just how different some of it is. Because you know, some when you watch them completely chronologically, some of these things change somewhat gradually, but from the first episode to the last episode, some of them are completely different, and it is just astounding how well the... Yeah. So, moving on. Yeah, so characters. Elizabeth Olsen as Wanda Maximoff Scarlet Witch, which... And this is, again, some of this is going to be straight from Wikipedia. Adventure who can... Let's see, harness magic, engaging telekinesis. Olsen said the series brings the character more in line with the comic book version, including... Uh, I suppose that's potentially a spoiler. Executive producer Kevin Feige added that the series explores the extent and origin of Maximoff's powers. Olsen felt her ownership of Maximoff was strengthened during the development of the series, which allowed her to explore new parts of the character's personality, such as her humor and sassiness. She was thrilled that WandaVision focuses on Maximoff rather than telling her story through everyone else's storylines, as in the films, and was sold on joining the series when Feige mentioned specific Scarlet Witch comic storylines that inspired WandaVision. Olsen was influenced by Mary Tyler Moore, Elizabeth Montgomery, and Lucille Ball for her performance. I haven't seen her in anything not related to the MCU. I would like to, though. She gets to play the character in a lot of different situations, and nails all of them. She has incredible range. She's one of the best. You wouldn't have guessed she was this incredible at sitcom acting from, you know, others. And and it's no, she hasn't been. M most of the people in this have not been in sitcoms. It's it's incredible how well they do at 
yeah, ad adopting each decade's mannerisms and the, yeah, you know, and, and if you know a lot of the sitcoms that ins helped inspire this, you know, you'll be sitting there watching and it's like, well, I mean, you know, in, in the first episode, for example, Vision is clearly Dick Van Dyke. It, it, there's a lot of Dick Van Dyke in his performance, you know, and the various, yeah, they, they, it's, it's this, it's the kind of thing where it's not an exact imitation, which can get kind of boring to just watch an exact imitation, but they, it's, it's as if, hypothetically, if you travel back in time to the 1950s and you put the first episode on, and people, you know, and you could do this for the core, for the different corresponding decades. The people in that decade would accept the sitcom as something that came from their, with with a few minor exceptions at least, would accept. Yeah, this was this was made in this decade. This this fits the the kind of thing. You know, a again, you know, some of the problematic aspects of older sitcoms is, you know, ad addressed here. Th this is a much more diverse you know, cast than a lot of sitcoms from a while back. And yeah, Paul Bettany as Vision, an android former Avenger, created using the artificial intelligence Jarvis and Ultron, as well as the Mind Stone. And yeah, Bettany described Vision as decent and honorable, and was, yeah, influenced by Dick Van Dyke and Hugh Laurie for his performance. And let's see. Yeah, he came from theater, and Shackman says he's a total ham, and that's you know that that's why he can do the different decades of sitcom so well. He's one of the best around. And Tiana Paris as I guess is that technically a spoiler? I guess what I will say is she she appears in the show and. Ger Geraldine. She has a toughness and ability to be a woman in a male-dominated world. And co-executive -ex producer Mary Lanos called her inclusion in the series a discovery when it was first being researched and developed that was not quite mapped out but became really enriched in the show. I would have to agree. And I haven't seen her in anything else, but I would really like to. She's smart, brave, snarky. She doesn't want to believe the worst about people if she feels like there's evidence countering that. And, you know, I'm not giving away right now what she might appear in in the future or what she'll be playing or such, but really looking forward to seeing her in more stuff. She's, she's one of the best actors in in this show and Catherine Hahn plays Agnes the nosy neighbor of the Maximals and Hahn described Agnes as the neighbor that won't get off their couch at the end of the night and is always in their business and Hahn was fascinated by the jolts of adrenaline and, and, and humanity when she provided and the fact that it had a gasp of human magic I haven't seen her in anything else, but I I have got to see her in something else as well. This she's she's unbelievably good in this. One of the best parts of the show. And Kat Dennings as Dr. Darcy Lewis, a political science major turned doctor who previously was an intern for Jane Foster and Friend of Thor, who's working with Jimmy Woo to solve a mystery. And I haven't seen her in anything not related to the MCU. I am aware of the sitcom, which apparently makes a lot of people hate her. I think I think if you're a celebrity, you get to have at least one really bad show or movie, and we should give them a chance beyond that. A lot of incredible actors, you know, the first thing they were in wasn't that good, and it's just... That doesn't. That I don't think that should define them for their, for the rest of their career. You know, if they have talent, give them a chance to to prove it beyond. But yeah, 
and her character has become a lot more confident and has now fully devoted herself to science since we last saw her in Thor 2. And Randall Park as Jim Woo, an FBI agent who is the parole officer of Scott Lang slash Ant-Man, and working with Dr. Darcy Lewis to solve a mystery. And Schaefer felt it was fun to feature Dennings and Park in the series since both were veteran sitcom actors previously on Two Broke Girls and Fresh Off the Boat, respectively. I haven't seen him in anything not comic book related. I'm, I'm not going to claim that I haven't seen him in anything not, not MCU because he is also in the... Is that a spoiler? No, that's not a spoiler. He's also in the DCU, but yeah. You know, other than comic books, I've, you know, he has done some college humor stuff I've seen and Neighbors. He's so good in this role. He's adorable, sweet, innocent. He doesn't like to speak ill of people, so him being paired up with Darcy, who speaks her mind, is a very fun relationship dynamic. And, yeah, you know, this show brings back some of the supporting cast from the different movies in the MCU that have some elements of magic or elements of very futuristic sci-fi, and they, they did a really great job. It, it makes so much sense how they brought in... No character is just here so that, excuse me, so that they'll get to, you know, so so that they're set up for later. I, I'm not going to pretend like there's nothing like that. I mean, yeah, I already mentioned I'm spoiling the MCU. I recently read the abridged script of Civil War, and it is kind of true that, uh, what's his name? I'm sorry, The, Ho the Hobbit. Did not need to be in that movie. You know, he's basically there so that when he shows up in Black Panther, we know who he is, and T'Challa knows who he is. That's basically it. He did not need to be in Civil War. He doesn't do, you know, the, the abridged script points out, he doesn't do anything that the the other Ross couldn't have done. You know, the, um, ah, I know his name. You know, but, yeah, General Thunderbolt Ross. And that's just not the case with this show. Every character has a reason to be here and does something that's, yeah. And the chemistry is incredible. Like, you really believe that Agnes is their neighbor and she's constantly showing up and, and she just won't leave, you know. And Wanda and Vish, I mean... We already knew that Wanda and Vision were incredible together when, you know, from their, from the movies that they are in, you know, they're, they're so sweet together. You love their love. You want them to pull through, you, you know, and yeah, everyone does an incredible job fitting into the sitcom world in each decade. The cast 100% got the, how, how to approach it. There's, there's no one here who doesn't completely understand what it you know what what is what is it we're doing here why why are people talking the way they are saying the things they are every single one of them clearly gets that that you know gets why these things are happening this way and they just they they absolutely nail it and the the dialogue it really nails the, the sitcom dialogue with corny jokes, fairly inoffensive material, also, you know, very supportive of the status quo, the nuclear family and such. There, I, I will say there are a few jokes that, in, in some of the early episodes, that, you know, the, that, uh, that joke would not have been in a sitcom from that time, but I don't think it, it doesn't pull you out of it, I would say. I, yeah, so in, in some of these videos, I try to go over, is this an original concept? I don't know of any other show or movie quite like this, honestly. I, I don't think this is the only, like, sitcom pastiche thing, but sitcom pastiche and tragic backstory and all, all of these different things put together, I've, I've not seen anywhere else. And the cinematography, you know, the, the DP 100% understood what they were 
working on and the cinematography a lot of the times lives up to the way sitcoms were filmed with you know simple the the simple setup with just a few cameras it you know differs based on the the decade they're doing let's see and yeah you know i th i think some of them are one maybe two cameras and the yeah it cuts the way that um you know yeah it, it edited the way that that is and yeah that setup makes it even more effective when it breaks from the formula and some more wikipedia hole used 47 different camera lens for the seven time periods covered in wandavision many of which were modern lenses custom modified to keep characteristics of the actual period lenses. As for lighting, tungsten lights were mainly used for the 1950s to the 1970s episodes, as those were the lights of the era with LED lighting become, becoming used starting in the 2000s episodes. As Hall explained, that was the correct timeline for when this equipment entered the filmmaking vocabulary. During moments when something goes wrong with Max, uh, I guess, yeah. Shackman did a lot of work with lenses and lighting to change the mood and to change the feel. And he added that these moments moved the series into a Twilight Zone territory, and that the sound design also played a key part in these moments. Filming took place on Blondie Street at the Warner Brothers Ranch in Burbank, California, where past sitcoms had also been filmed. Shackman felt the Blondie Street backlot had that weird sense of fakeness that no real-life street could replicate. And let's see... Yeah, and so the, the editing, again, you know, it, it fits the sitcom that each episode fits the sitcom that that episode's going for. And every so often, the, the editing will make it very clear that there's something going on that, that shouldn't be. You know, there's, there will be flickers of things that can't normally happen. And the show does have a little animation, little old-fashioned to the animation similar to Bewitched and they did a really great job like I've seen like I've seen a shot-by-shot -shot comparison of stuff that would be on Bewitched with with the, this show and yeah they, they absolutely nailed it and that's like a lot of the special effects on this show are handled the way they would have been on the sitcom since this is, you know, they do have superpowers. You know, Wanda has telekinesis. She's not the first female sitcom star to have telekinesis. And that's, yeah, the special effects team created wire rigs along with camera tricks to make props move by Max Mops magic, as was done in series like Bewitched and I Dream of Genie. And Bethany estimated that the series had more visual effect shots than the 2,496 in Avengers Endgame. And let's see, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the time they they go for charmingly old-fashioned effects, and the the there's not a ton of stunts, but they are really well done. And the the show does a good job having varied locations, despite so much of it being set in this suburban sitcom. As a few quick examples, you obviously see the inside of the of Wanda and Vision's house. You see the inside of some other people's houses. You see where the the office where Vision works. There is a library. You know there there are various different places around the this suburban town. And yeah, so let's see. Yeah, so as far as action scenes, I'm going to give some spoilers, but first I'll say definitely there's some tension and suspense, but yeah, if you, yeah, spoilers for the show, if you want to know when to expect action scenes, there's some in episode 6, 7, and 8, and 
nine and yeah no more spoilers for now and yeah you know some of the scenes on this are psychological horror supernatural horror and they're incredibly effective like this show knows how to do nightmare fuel it it really pushes the pg-13 rating and yeah it, it has some of the most disturbing stuff i've seen in any yeah now i'm not going to give away exactly who the villains are how many there are I will just say they're deeply memorable. They're they're absolutely incredible. I know that you know the the MCU has not had the best track record. Some of the villains are a little you know average, not that memorable. This is an incredibly memorable one, and this shows villainy. See, I guess. The villains of this show, yes. That's what I'll go with. And I won't give away what relationship they do have to the protagonists of the show, but I will say it's very memorable. You you really care about their relationship. And yeah, it's it's very easy to follow and it's meant to, and I agree with the decision. It you know, it's the kind of thing where, for so much of the time, things like there there'll be some there'll be surprises and such, but what happens will basically be stuff that you could imagine happening in this kind of sitcom, you know, and then every so often there'll be something that doesn't fit in, and it's really, really effective. And yeah, so the the music, again, a lot of this is gonna be Wikipedia, year twenty twenty, Christoph. Beck announced he would compose the score for the series after previously scoring Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp. Beck tried to pay homages to the scores of sitcoms in each time period through his choice of instrumentation and compositional style. He did incredible. I, I, each time, yeah. For example, the earlier episodes feature small orchestral ensembles, while later episodes have more of a rock pop style, with music becoming more pervasive as the series progresses. He called it exciting to find ways to connect the scores together, even as they span the stylistic variety across all the episodes, such as through the love theme he composed for Maximoff and Vision. Beck also utilized period-specific recording and mixing techniques. And in December 2020, Robert Lopez and Christy Anderson Lopez were announced to have written theme songs for some of the series episodes. They were approached for the series by Shackman, who's friends with Lopez at college. They previously recorded with Beck on music for Disney's Frozen franchise. In order to tie their themes together, Lopez and Anderson Lopez created a four-note motif that worked in each style of theme song created. Lopez described the motif kind of like the WandaVision call-out, easily identifiable in some way in each song. The theme for the first episode evokes the dawn of television and is about love between Maximoff and Vision. And, yeah, so the comedy, the, the show is legitimately funny as a sitcom. You know, if you just watch this, ex you know, and you just watch a sitcom, yeah, the material feels like a sitcom from then, and the laugh track doesn't feel obtrusive, and, yeah, it's, apparently some of it was actually filmed in front of a live studio audience and some of the cast were super nervous but happy with how it came out and yeah the the there's actually there's there's times where characters will make a corny sitcom joke and you'll watch and you'll you'll be thinking that's not funny that's that's creepy and the fact that there is this laughing audience makes it even more creepy. You know, it's it's one thing if it was just creepy, but some of the characters act like it's not. They act like there's nothing wrong, and it's it's legitimately incredibly unsettling. 
But yeah, the types of comedy, slapstick, other physical comedy, verbal comedy, comedic miscommunications, running gags, observational comedy, one-liners, wordplay, satire on class differences. Each time we see a new decades sitcom, they manage to do jokes that fit that, but are still, excuse me, but are still funny and fit with the characters and the relationships, despite the bland, inoffensive, milk toast nature of the ones from the 50s and 60s, as it was back then. I will say, even, yeah, some of those jokes are a bit more risque and subversive than they would have been back then. Some sexual references, for example. And, let's see. yeah, like I mentioned, it's got more ethnic and gender diversity than was common. But ethnic diversity, at least. I, I guess the, yeah, those shows did have, or did they not have very many women? And anyway, this has ethnic and gender diversity more so than was common for sitcoms or TV shows in general back then. Those shows were so white, the glare was blinding. And it has the teaching and or sad moments of the 80s, the cynicism of the 90s, aughts and tens, I guess. Is, I, yeah. And, yeah, see, so MCU definitely have a how. The MCU definitely has a house style, though they do also try to make sure most of the individual MCU entries have a genre and an approach to make them more distinct. But, yeah, this is... This is probably the most distinct that the, the MCU has done so far. Romantic sitcom with psychological horror and supernatural thriller elements, mystery, action. At times the mystery can be limited to clues, and they definitely want you to go online, search Google or YouTube for what those clues mean. After watching an episode, you know, engagement. And if that isn't your kind of thing, then the show might just not be for you unless you already read the comics and you already know all these Easter eggs. And they clearly are not falling in, falling into one of the many traps that Lost, that show, did. Opening way too many doors, creating way too many mysteries where it would basically be impossible for them to answer everything, much less make everything cohesive. Here the mysteries are connected. Unlike with Lost, every single time I caught an Easter egg or a clue or something this, I could tell that the people who put it there know where they're going with it. And they aren't just going to do any cool idea they have, regardless of whether they can make it make sense in the overall universe. And you really can spend hours upon hours finding Easter eggs, googling what they mean, theorizing with other people. And they also do a far better job on this show than on Lost, with the slow, steady drip of information that is necessary keep people engaged in a mystery told in any serial form. And the answers are much more satisfying. They don't start answering questions right away, but as soon as they do start answering them, the answers are to questions that we especially want to know about, without giving away so much that you are no longer wondering about the core mystery. And I, I saw someone on you, here on YouTube point out, they answer some questions, but a few new ones will be asked when, yeah, and they, they, yeah, they do a really good job on that. And I know it's, you know, Lost was an ongoing series, it wasn't a miniseries, but they still didn't handle it as well as they should have. Now, I... I don't know any other sitcom that has horror going on and every so often bubbling up to the surface like this. And as far as, so yeah, violence and gore, yeah, so the, the, every so often something will happen that really pushes the, the PG-13 rating. And... Yeah, and the, the tone, you know, at, at times creepy, sometimes cheesy, intentionally and to good effect, charming, mild. The pacing is smooth, but not too fast. There's tons of material, and entire episodes just fly by. There was never a time in this show when I wanted for things to move faster than they were. I was always, if, or slower, 
you know, it always, I, I never lost track, and I never, the, the show never loses momentum. You know, the, the, so, so again, you know, the, in the oldest episodes, the, it'll be kind of milk toast, kind of inoffensive stuff, but the, the sitcoms did still have a, a reasonable pace. You know, they, they, I think it would be 22 or 23 minutes, and then with breaks in between. So they did have to move the story along fast enough, you know, and make sure that the, you know, like every other show on American television, they have to make sure that people come back, even though there will be a, an ad break. I don't know, is it every seven minutes or something, you know, so... They have to keep it moving and keep ending, you know, going to advertisements on something that people want to see more of. And, yeah, the, so this does get that. And, yeah, so this show only has one season and nine episodes. And, let's see. Yeah, like actual sitcoms, an episode may be around 20 minutes without ads. And further, it will be like an episode of a sitcom, an A plot and a B plot, everything resolved, neatly resolved by the end of the episode. Again, not necessarily every single episode, but that's how it, you know, and maybe sometimes there'll be a break from some of that. And, yeah, so just briefly, I sometimes bring up my history with the franchise. I've watched every single MCU movie at least twice, most of them more than twice. And I guess I will give just, yeah, very briefly, I'm going to talk about these are the sitcoms that I have watched, and some of them I've watched all of. Let's see, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll start. These are alphabetically. I've watched all of Eight Simple Rules, and I would give it an 8 out of 10. I've watched all of Aliens in America, 8 out of 10. Hello, hello, watched all of 8 out of 10. i really not sure how much I watched of American Dad, but I really love what I watched. I would give those episodes an overall 8 out of 10. Same for what I watched of Becker. I don't think it was very many episodes. I've watched everything related to Black Adder, 8 out of 10. And let's see. Brothers, which I would give a 5 out of 10. I didn't watch very much of Cheers, but I remember it as being a 7 out of 10 kind of thing. I watched all of Dilbert. I give it an 8 out of 10. I know the guy who created is problematic. I watched. I think I watched all of Dream On. I would give that an 8 out of 10. I watched all of the Drew Carey Show, 8 out of 10. Ellen, 8 out of 10. I don't know how much I've watched of The Flintstones, but I remember it as being a 7 out of 10 show. I think I might have watched all of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, 5 out of 10. Full House, I would give it about 3 out of 10. It's way too bland and milk toast. And I watched the first four years, yeah, yeah, the first several years of Futurama, I'd give it a 7 out of 10. I haven't watched the newer episodes after it was brought back. I think I watched all of the Golden Girls, I'd give it a 7 out of 10. I don't know, I had a lot of free time. It was inoffensive. And I watched all of Good Morning Miami, 6 out of 10. Watched all of Home Improvement, 7 out of 10. All of, I've seen all of I'm With Her, 5 out of 10. I've seen all of Just Shoot Me, 7 out of 10. I am not sure how much King of the Hill I watched, but I would give it an 8 out of 10. I watched all of Living with Fran, 5 out of 10. Yeah, I know. I kept watching because it's Fran Drescher. And I liked uh, The Nanny. I, I, I'm not sure how much I watched of Man About You, but I'd give the episodes I watched, 7 out of 10. Major Dad, not sure how much I watched, 7 out of 10. Malcolm in the Middle, not sure how much watched, 7 out of 10. Mary with Children, watched all of it, 8 out of 10. Mork and Mindy, not sure how much. I might have watched all of that, thinking about it. I think I watched all of that, 8 out of 10. Mr. Bean, watched all of it, 8 out of 10. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, all of it, 7 out of 10. 
Scrubs, the first several years, 7 out of 10. Seinfeld, the first several years, 7 out of 10. Sex and the City, watched all of it, 7 out of 10. Simpsons, watched the first 7, ah, I mean, hmm. The first 7 seasons I would give 7 out of 10. I watched some of the next seasons, but they got real bad. Watched all of South Park, 8 out of 10. Watched all of Spaced, 8 out of 10. Watched some of Spin City, 7 out of 10. Some of Sports Night, 7 out of 10. All of Suddenly Susan, 7 out of 10. All of Two and a Half Men, 10 out of 10. And another viewer kind of just dropped. All of Unhappily Ever After, 7 out of 10. Possibly all of Yes, Dear. Certainly a lot of it, 5 out of 10. And some of Yes Minister, I, first season, I think, of Yes Minister, 7 out of 10. Oh, yeah, I, I guess I didn't put The Nanny. I watched all of The Nanny. I'd give it a 7 out of 10. And, yeah, so the mix of sitcom and supernatural thriller is something I haven't seen elsewhere. Honestly, and I say this with full confidence, you could show me a brief clip from any episode, and I would be able to place which episode it's from, even if I hadn't watched the show for half a year between, yeah, since, even if you asked me six months after the last time I'd watched the show, and I do mean beyond the obvious that some of them are black and white, some of them are color, the tone, the clothes, the set design, the acting, the music, everything so thoroughly places each episode in its corresponding set, sitcom decade. Like, honestly, if you made some of the black and, if you colorized some of the black and white and black and white it, the some of the color episodes, I would still be able to tell, no, 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 that was originally for the other, you know. And, let's see. I don't, I wouldn't let someone who's not at least a teenager watch this. And overall, it's not really like, it's not especially offensive or that kind of thing. I mean, there, there are definitely some things that will bother some people, but I think most of it you can guess from just knowing the, you know, Wanda and Vision. Yeah. And I would say the, the best element of this is the fact that you can tell something is off from right away but you're not sure exactly what's going on, and you can never quite know when there's suddenly going to be something supernatural. And making it even creepier, David Lynchian, such as in the cinematography, is that frequently the characters will seem oblivious or will laugh it off, because nothing quite that upsetting happens on the kind of sitcoms that this is emulating. So they just kind of assume, it can't be that bad, you know, and it's, it's a, yeah, it's just... The, the, um, yeah, I think I've talked enough about that aspect of it. Now, let's see, I guess, um, I, in, in these reviews, I try to find, is, is there something that I would point to and say that is the, the, the worst thing about it, and as a sort of, you know, so so people know if that's something that's going to bother them, it'll bother them on this show. I, I mean, some people won't like, if, if you don't like the MCU, in some ways this is way more, you know, way, way further off the mainstream than the, the rest of the MCU. But the, there are still a number of MCU traits in there, and if you don't like the MCU, if you don't like how they handle humor, action, characterization, then some of those things will bother you in this show as well. But let's see, if I personally had to point to something in this show that is... I don't, I don't think I can. I can't. I don't think I can think of something that I could point to and say this is legitimately. There are reasons why it won't be for everyone, but there's nothing about it that I would really say. I mean, I guess I could joke and say that it eventually ended because I, I want more of it. 
but the fact that it left me wanting more is exactly right. Like, if you if you watch an entire show and then by the, you know, yeah, if you're if you're trying to watch the overall run of a show, and along the way you're just like, I can't, I don't want to keep watching that. You know, I I I, I talked to one of my friends about this show and he talked about how he used to watch The Walking Dead, and after a while he just he realized. I'm not enjoying watching the show, and so he stopped. And that's, you know, if if you do that, then you know that that's the kind of thing you want to avoid when you're making a, a show, whether it's a miniseries or an ongoing series. And I think they they could have tried to draw this out much more, or they could have tried to squeeze it into a movie, or or multiple movies. I'm really glad that they did it this exact way. You know, I mean, if we're talking, you know, well, they definitely want to make sure people, uh, you know, subscribe to Disney Plus at least temporarily. Well, nine episodes, that's, uh, you know, two months and one week. So, you know, if, if but if they had said, okay, from now on, there's, I mean, technically there will be more. Excuse me. There will be more Disney Plus Marvel Studio shows but it's going to be different ones, you know, and a number of them will have several episodes. And I think at least some of them will, in, in fact, have multiple seasons. But they're not trying to just milk it for everything it's worth. And I really appreciate that. I, I don't feel like it was too long or too short. The, the, the pacing I really love. Yeah, the, there isn't really... I, I, I don't really have anything negative to say. I was, before I started watching, I was worried that it might not get the difficult tone quite right. In addition to feeling like a classic sitcom, it should still be funny for today's audience, not be regressive, and the, the, yeah, and, and it manages to be creepy, and the mystery element really works, and, yeah. You know, the show exceeded my expectations. And let's see. Yeah, so the thing I was most looking forward to before I started watching it was the, the mix of creepy what's going on and legitimately entertaining and engaging sitcom pastiche. And the show exceeded my expectations. Honestly, the cast and crew all do really great. I hope they do more comedy. I had not expected them to be this adept at it, but it's, it's unreal. They, they nail it. It's, it's, yeah. And let's see. So on a scale of one to 10, I mean, I guess I have to think is, is there something that prevents it from being a perfect 10? Hmm. I, I don't think there really is. Yeah, yeah, perfect 10. And let's see. Right, and yeah, some more briefly from Wikipedia. WandaVision is scheduled to premiere on January 15, 2021, with the release of its first two episodes on Disney Plus, with the other seven episodes releasing each week until March 5th. Marvel Studios considered releasing the entire season at once, but looked at the fun of week to week that the Disney Plus Star Wars series The Mandalorian provided for sticking with the weekly releases. Feige stated the episodes were built with the weekly release in mind, noting there's something fun to be able to follow along, try to guess what happens next, to have a week speculating or rewatching and building that anticipation. Additionally, he believed that there would be another equally fun experience binge watching the entire series. And yeah, honestly, all all nine episodes stand out to me as as incredible and I yeah, I love all nine of them. I, when, when I talk about an entire TV show, I try to be very critical and say, well, technically I don't love just these few episodes, but for this, yeah. 
and it's fun to watch. It's it's really high quality. I recommend it to fans of sitcoms, fans of The Twilight Zone, and anyone following the MCU. And yeah, so I am going to briefly scroll through. I copied in the Rotten Tomatoes critics quotes, and I'm going to see if there's something. WandaVision feels like a vindication for my fandom. At least two of my most beloved MCU characters, who only have got teeny tiny scenes in bigger, more grandiose stories, have a show of their own. And... So, I am going... Yeah, scrolling through... Yeah, and some of these are also based on the first three episodes, and for sure, like, if you watch the first three episodes and you're like, I don't know about this, give it at least one or two more episodes before you decide not to watch. For the first time in a long, long time, I have no idea what to expect from my Marvel thing, and that's a nice surprise. If you're one of those Marvel Cinematic Universe fans who feel it's time for something truly unique and different, meet WandaVision. WandaVision is unique, original, and fun. At the same time, uh, nah. Uh, let's see. And... WandaVision del delivers a fun ramble through sitcom history with the added benefit if you haven't already seen each episode a dozen times in reruns. At the edges of WandaVision's simple pleasures lurks the extended MCU, clouding the best moments uh, with more than a little foreboding. It's not all going to last. And yeah, some some of them basically say that it's too. It some people felt that too much time passed in the show before. Uh, what's the word? In, in some of the early episodes, it is primarily a sitcom, you know, with, with occasionally something creepy. And some people felt that too long passed of that, that they should have gone further than that earlier. And I just, I disagree. But, yeah, I, I think if you reach the halfway point of the show and you find that you don't still want to watch then I, that might be a fine place to, to stop. I, I don't think, I'm not sure there's much left the show could really do to, to hook you in. Although, uh, I mean, if you stop there, maybe talk to someone who's watched the entire show and if they can maybe, without spoiling what you haven't seen yet, have them, you know, it, yeah, ask them if enough things will, if, if the, something will really change about the show. And if they think you will like the show after that, some, something like that. This is such a departure from Marvel Studios that it may take a few episodes to settle into the pace of this unique, funny, weird trip into sitcom TV history. Magnetic, a great metaphor for how a series seeks to forever modify the consumption of superheroes on TV today. And the classic comedy pastiche is skillful, affectionate, and well-performed.
part Plesno, part The Truman Show, The Sinister Splash of David Lynch subversive surrealist mystery, WandaVision is one of the most unique Marvel properties to date. So weirdly different from what we've come to expect from Marvel that it might serve as a gateway drug for people who've steadfastly resisted the superhero genre thus far. WandaVision is a bold series and very different from what we've previously seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and just like Thor Ragnarok, it's a feeling that this universe needs. And scrolling, there we go. I certainly look forward to finding out what direction the show takes. Its mystery box presentation is a delightful showcase for Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen's obvious chemistry, and the costume department's limitless budget. WandaVision signals a bold and exciting new direction for Marvel. WandaVision's core conceit, that sometimes you just want to escape into television, into fantasy, into daydream, couldn't be more meta. Let's stay here in this happiness just a little while longer. The world outside is so dark. WandaVision is a wholly unique, wonderful, mesmerizing, and wildly entertaining Marvel adventure. An absolute winner for the MCU with a phenomenal performance from Elizabeth Olsen. It feels simultaneously wildly experimental. Yeah. And let's see. Yeah. It's compelling, gripping, fun, and inventive television. It's worth sticking around just to see what jaunty new theme tunes they can come with, come up with every week. The feel and tone of the show is a bold choice, but one that absolutely pays off. The result wields more of a scalpel than a hammer, wryly celebrating the history of television while slowly pulling the viewer into an enticing Twilight Zone-esque mystery. The two leads are surrounded by a strong cast that includes Catherine Hahn as Agnes, the neighbor who's up in everybody's business, delivers her lines as if they're sliding out the side of her mouth. She's perfect. The chemistry between Bettany Olsen and ambitious original sitcom will have you utterly scarlet bewitched. It's the weird reality TV escape we didn't know we needed in 2021. The show gets more intriguing with each episode. It's great TV on its own merits, but for those who relish these stories but also always want them to reach further, WandaVision is a true triumph. Consider WandaVision an unusual first step for this new Marvel phase. The best parts lovingly conjure the mood of very old television shows. WandaVision also excels at visual history of the TV comedy, transitioning to the bright candy colors of the 1970s. And let's see. As a loving pastiche of creaky American sitcoms, WandaVision is endearing, and Olsen and Bettany are clearly having a hoot in their retro frocks and dad sweaters. But it's that rising dread that will bring Marvel fans scrambling back for more. 
With a clear affection for its corny inspirations, WandaVision manages to avoid cheesy punchlines. WandaVision is the Marvel Cinematic Universe sitcom we need right now. The series is a true love letter to television history in general. It's rare to encounter a TV show that remains enjoyable in spite of how little information it gives to the audience. WandaVision is tapping into a power that the MCU has been sitting on for about for a decade, and like Wanda ripping Thanos apart in Endgame, it's about time we see what this thing can really do. If you were looking for charming stars to convey a mere time and more Dick Van Dyke vibe, you couldn't do much better, as Olsen and Betty get to spell out the sweet chemistry that the movies have only hinted at. Yeah, and one of the reviewers points out, in some ways, it's more of the same for the MCU, and he points out, for better or worse, something genuinely different from the MCU, Elizabeth Olsen, Paul Bettany, and the creative team do a wonderful job recreating classic sitcoms, plus a really good Marvel mystery. This is essentially the first time we have gotten an MCU mystery, like a major mystery, and they do incredible at it. It's... It, Every time a franchise or a particular filmmaker or writer or whatever, the first time they handle something very different from what we're used to do, them doing, you know, there's there's some chance that they're gonna they're not gonna get it completely right. And here they 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 did get it completely right. The the yeah. A love letter to sitcoms and the perfect show to bring us back into the MCU, WandaVision is Marvel's most exciting project yet, with an unmissable Emmy worth performance from Elizabeth Olsen. Let's see, and yeah, the the right. I give this a 10 glitches in the illusion out of 10. It's incredible how fast a show can move today, and this is honestly one of my all-time favorite shows. This, yeah. I guess I could just briefly, yeah, since it's a, since it's a miniseries, some other miniseries, I, I swear I won't take too long, since I didn't write it down, but Five Days to Midnight, Crap. What was it called again? The Lost... The Lost Room? Are those... Actually... Yeah, but anyway, yeah. I like this a lot more than those. I do still love The Lost Room. If I ever get a copy, I'll probably do a video on it. And yeah, there's also... There's the... the I don't... Uh, right. Robocop Prime Directives, which also I, I do really like a lot, but yeah, this is better than that. I think those might be the miniseries. I think I tend to, I mean, primarily I watch movies, but then also sometimes ongoing shows. I haven't watched that many miniseries, but yeah. I think the... Yeah, that, that is everything that I wanted to say. So I hope that I'm, you know, I, I, I want to say that I hoped I convinced you to watch the show, but to I hope that I helped you decide 
whether or not you want to watch the show. If you, if the show is not for you, I hope I've been able to make, to, to give enough details about what it's like so that you can base, the, so, so that this video can be useful for you in figuring out if the show is for you. I mean, nine episodes, it is, it is a bit of an investment of time and I mean, okay, Corona lockdown, so people have a lot of spare time these days, of course, but still, you know, it is, yeah, and especially if you don't already have Disney+, Plus, you know, the, the moment that, the moment that I found out that there were going to be some things on Disney+, Plus that you couldn't get anywhere else, that are more, that are MCU, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, you have my money, Disney. Nicely done. I and and so far I'm really happy with the decision. And yeah, so the the yeah, so I hope this review has been useful. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time.